If you are interested in 20th century literature, you should read Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet. If, in addition, you happen to be a writer, then you simply must read it. Waiting for me on my shelves, I have many books about which all I know is that they need to be read. Some of them I have not looked up. I may not even have read the back cover. I want the book itself to reveal its contents and its secrets to me, with as little prejudice on my part as possible. I bought my copy of Justine back in 2006. I lost count of the times I picked it up and read the first pages, only to put the novel back on the shelf, thinking, not now, not yet. In the spring of 2020, right before the COVID pandemic, I picked up the novel again, and this time I couldn't stop reading. Darwell explains his plan for the Alexandria Quartet in the second novel of the cycle, Baltasar, where he says that the first three novels are siblings and only the fourth is a sequel, in the strict sense of the term. The novels, Darrell continues, illustrate the Bergsonian concept of duration and are patterned after the relativity proposition. The first three novels, then, represent space. The last one, time. When I was 19, I read Julio Cortázar's Hopscotch. For me, the reading of this novel was a rite of passage. If you like literature and you were born in Argentina, there's no way around it. You must read this novel at one point in your life, even if it is just so that you can reasonably proclaim your hatred of it. I did not hate it. Or rather, I did hate it, but I also loved it. That's another story. It was such an original novel, such a fresh, different way of telling a story. The novel was not really about anything. It followed the life experiences of a guy who did not fit in. It was so European and so Argentinian, so Argentinian by the mere fact that it was trying to be so European. And that structure that allowed you to jump from one chapter to another, it prefigured the Choose Your Own Adventure series. I was some 20 or 30 pages into Justine when I said to myself, wait a minute, that narrative tone, those ideas about love and literature, the self-reflexive element, the group of friends, as opposed to family, trying to discover the meaning of life, the character of the author, Arnaudi, the obsessive search for the woman, the presence of the city, even the consequential data at the end of the book. A search on the internet revealed that Cortázar's wife, Aurora Bernardes, had been translating the Alexandria Quartet while Cortázar was writing Hopscotch. Justine is, if we take the narrator's own words in the last pages of the novel, a brief introductory memorial to Alexandria. The city itself is the main character. In Baltasar, the same narrator says that he could have titled the manuscript simply Calle. Justine the woman is important, however. She haunts the author of the notes and impressions that make up the novel. There is no plot. We simply follow a group of friends or acquaintances as they meet, crash into each other, and drift apart. How, then, does the narrator keep the reader interested for 252 pages? By the sheer power of his descriptive, reflexive, narrative prose. This is one of the richest, densest novels written in the English language. One may hate the characters. One may be put off by the general theme, but the style is unquestionably satisfying, mesmerizing. Some will argue that style, form, may not be divorced from content. That, as I like to say, is another story. In regard to the central topic, Darrell himself provides it, once again in his introduction to Baltasar, an investigation of modern love. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it is really love that he is talking about, or whether part of the point is that modern love is not love at all. A few sentences and passages that caught my attention will give you an idea of the book's tone. Like all egoists, I cannot bear to live alone. There are only three things to be done with a woman, said Clea once. You can love her, suffer for her, or turn her into literature. For those of us who feel deeply and who are at all conscious of the inextricable tangle of human thought, 
there is only one response to be made, ironic tenderness and silence. What I most need to do is to record experiences, not in the order in which they took place, but in the order in which they first became significant for me. Somewhere in the heart of experience there is an order and the coherence which we might surprise if we were attentive enough, loving enough, or patient enough. This is a novel to savor. It is a quick read, but you don't want to read it quickly. You want to take your time with it. I read it over a week, and by the time I was done, I felt I had shared a vision with the narrator. Justine and Balthasar are in a sense about the same thing, modern love and the city of Alexandria, and yet their approach is entirely different. The note that opens Balthasar is quite illuminating for the reader of the entire quartet, and while I understand why Darrell may have chosen to include it only in the second novel, I am glad I read it while I was still reading Justine. In this prologue, Darrell explains that the first three novels of the quartet are siblings, and only the last one, Clea, is a true sequel. In the third novel, Mount Olive, the author anticipates, the narrator becomes a character. I would describe Balthasar as Justine Squared. The second novel in the quartet, in other words, is more clearly metafictional than the first. If the narrator, whose name is revealed to be Darley in this novel, shared his reflections on a woman and the city in Justine, in Balthasar we encounter reflections on those initial reflections. At the beginning of this second novel, the narrator sends Balthasar a copy of the manuscript of Justine and gets feedback on it from his friend. At this point, Darley is still on the island with Melissa's child, recreating, examining the past through the act of writing. He writes in order to deliver himself from the city. I must set it all down in cold black and white until such time as the memory and the impulse of it is spent. I know that the key I am trying to turn is in myself. On the same page we also find the following meditation. Slowly, reluctantly, I have been driven back to my starting point like a man who at the end of a tremendous journey is told that he has been sleepwalking. Besides the metafictional element, the reader may expect more descriptions of local rituals and the handful of tropes from mystery novels. If the style was enough to keep me interested in Justine, despite the fact that nothing really happens in the novel, Balthasar relies more on local color and police investigations or intrigue. As I read the second novel, I kept thinking of the Guermont Way, the third volume in Proust's cycle. The novels have nothing to do with each other. What I mean is that they both slow things down. That is, they are too reflexive for my taste, as if they overstated the point. Balthasar is nevertheless full of brilliant moments. Consider this passage. The deep, still river of her heart hoarded its images ever reflecting them in the racing current, letting them sink deeper into memory than most of us can. Real innocence can do nothing that is trivial, and when it is allied to generosity of heart, the combination makes it the most vulnerable of qualities under heaven. Not many authors can go so majestically from sensory description to philosophical insight. It's like a difficult dance step executed with absolute grace. This, by the way, is not even a crucial passage in the novel. To borrow an idea from Balthasar himself, Balthasar the novel is a layer added to Justine, or a palimpsest, where different sorts of truth are thrown down one upon the other, the one obliterating or perhaps supplementing another. The analogy, Balthasar continues, is a great one for Alexandria itself, which is at once sacred and profane. How then am I to manipulate this mass of crystallized data in order to work out the meaning of it and so give a coherent picture of this impossible city of love and obscenity, the narrator then wonders. The novels are, of course, an attempt to answer this question. 
And here's Balthazar again, offering us clues to better appreciate the novel's structure. To intercalate realities is the only way to be faithful to time. For at every moment in time, the possibilities are endless in their multiplicity. Life consists in the act of choice, the perpetual reservation of judgment and the perpetual choosing. Borges would have agreed with the first half of this passage. Chesterton with the second. I doubt, however, that either one of these authors would have enjoyed the Alexandria Quartet. But that's another story. These are the strange ways in which people grow up, the narrator observes at one point. Isn't this, in a sense, a great synopsis of the quartet? As part of the consequential data at the end of the novel, the author includes a few notes on Peirce Warden's view of his work. Among them one finds this. My object in the novels? To interrogate human values through an honest representation of the human passions. A desirable end. Perhaps a hopeless objective. Published in 1959, Mount Olive is the third volume of the Alexandria Quartet. In his preface to Balthazar, the second novel, Dorrell describes Mount Olive as a straight, naturalistic novel in which the narrator of Justine and Balthazar becomes an object, that is, a character. Indeed, Darley, the narrator of the first two novels, appears in Mount Olive as a character, but only briefly. I was expecting this novel to provide more insight into the narrator of the two previous ones from the perspective of David Mount Olive, the diplomat who had been until now a secondary character. Instead, it is the diplomat himself who is the focus of this third novel, and so we take some distance from Justine, Melissa, Kalia, and Darley, though not from the Hosnanis. What does Darrell mean when he calls this novel naturalistic? Justine and Balthazar are metafictional, the latter more so than the former. Mount Olive is much more traditional in its execution and narrative purpose, though it never becomes cliché or flat thanks to Darrell's powerful narrative voice. I would describe Mount Olive as a literary political thriller in the vein of Graham Greene's The Quiet American, though of a more introspective nature. Mount Olive portrays the ultimate loneliness and detachment of the diplomat, who does not have true friends, and whose connections with others are inevitably ruined by his political worldview. As the novel begins, Mount Olive is having an affair with Leila, Nesim and Naruz's mother. Events soon separate them, but Mount Olive continues to think of his lover in the midst of political intrigue and international conflict. The reader will recall Darley attempting to free himself from Justine and from Alexandria in the first novel by writing about them. Mount Olive, however, is no writer. There is no consequential data at the end of this novel, no meditations on the craft of writing at any point. Mount Olive is a mediocre figure, a hollow man who discovers by the end of the novel the devastating effects that time may have on human beings. This is an excellent novel. I simply miss Darley as a narrator and the self-reflexive nature of the first novels. Mount Olive may be read as criticism or analysis of European involvement in the Middle East and or North Africa, as it explores the distance that will always separate the colonizer from the colonized. No matter how much the two cultures flow into and out of each other, they never truly mix. If the first three novels of the Alexandria Quartet correspond to the notion of space, the concluding novel represents time. Clea is, once again, the only one of the novels that may be accurately described as a sequel. Although I do not recommend doing it, you may read the four novels in a different order, without losing the thread. This work does not have a center, but several nuclei. This is one of many similarities with Julio Cortázar's Hopscotch, a novel that was obviously written under the influence of Darrell's Quartet. 
Justine introduces the reader to the city of Alexandria and to the narrator's milieu. Balthasar is an assessment of the narrative presented in the first novel. Mount Olive follows a diplomat who had been a minor character in the first two novels and offers his perspective on some of the events previously narrated. My favorite of these three novels was Justine, and I found Clea to be equally compelling. The novel opens with Darley's return with Melissa's child to Alexandria after his time of reflection on the unnamed island where he wrote the impressions that constitute Justine. As he meets his old acquaintances, the characters realize that the passing of time and the war have had lasting effects on them. Darley finally finds Justine, who will come to form a family of sorts with Nassim and Melissa's child. The encounter is so disappointing that Darley moves on to the painter Clea. According to Darrow, the central topic of the quartet is modern love. The first novel includes two epigraphs, one by Freud and one by the Marquis de Sade. All of the remaining novels open with epigraphs by Sade. The characters we follow in these novels, who could be described as the children of Freud and Sade, desperately search for love through their physical connections with one another. One word, love, has to do service for so many different kinds of the same animal, the narrator says at one point. And later on, the sex act is the most important, the one in which our spirits most divulge themselves. Yet one feels it is a sort of clumsy paraphrase of the poetic, the noetic thought which shapes itself into a kiss or an embrace. Underlying these novels is a mood of controlled despair. One could say about the quartet what Dante Gabriel Rossetti said about Wuthering Heights. The action is laid in hell, only it seems people have English names there. In the hell of the quartet, however, the characters are not consumed by flames, but roasted alive over a low fire. Let me go back to Cortázar briefly. In the 60s and 70s, he was venerated in Latin America. Then some readers began to realize that his machismo was so pronounced that it made Hemingway look like a feminist. The same macho viewpoint is evident in the quartet through Darley, who says, Under all these masks, there was only another woman, every woman, like a lay figure in a dressmaker's shop, waiting for the poet to clothe her, breathe life into her. I began to realize with awe the enormous reflexive power of woman, the fecund passivity with which, like the moon, she borrows her second-hand light from the male sun. Cortázar first got in big trouble when he spoke derisively of the lector hembra, female reader, but hembra is the specific term used to describe female animals, as a passive reader. He later retracted his words. One of the most interesting chapters of the novel is found in the physical center of the text. We are allowed to read a long passage from Purse Warden's notebook titled My Conversations with Brother Ass. This satirical chapter, in which we read about Purse Warden's exchanges with Darley, is full of insight about art and literature. Artists are composed of vanity, indolence and self-regard. Work blocks are caused by the swelling up of the ego on one or all of these fronts. My solution would be to tell your ego to go to hell and not make a misery of what should be essentially fun, joy. Purse Warden also provides the structural key to the quartet itself when he tells Darley, You might try a four-card trick in the form of a novel, passing a common axis through four stories. A continuum, forsooth, embodying not a temps retrouvé, but a temps délivré, and nothing very recherché either, just an ordinary girl-meets-boy story. But tackled in this way, you would not, like most of your contemporaries, be drowsily cutting along a dotted line. The second half of Clea is quite dark, especially after Darley visits Mount Olive and his lover, the blind Liza, who was Purse Warden's sister. In this novel, we learn crucial details about the events concerning Purse Warden described in Mount Olive. This is followed by a shocking revelation that proves just how lost 
some of these characters are in their search for love. The word with four faces. Four letters, each letter a volume, Perse Warden says. Four novels, four persons. And let's not forget Freud's idea, cited at the beginning of Justine, that every sexual act involves four persons. Multi-perspective works question by their very form the credibility of narrative. Long before Darrow wrote the quartet, the traditional novel had been challenged by the modernists. We do find out, however, what happened to the characters by the end of Clea. It may be impossible to narrate, but writers will continue to do it. Art is the attempt to get as close as possible to an unreachable goal. Justine is my favorite of the four novels. Clea is a close second. Next would be Balthasar, then Mount Olive, which was by far my least favorite. As I read that third novel, I kept asking myself, why Mount Olive, of all characters? I came to realize that he is not the protagonist. The novel is as much about Perse Warden, who is also a key figure in Clea, as it is about him. Balthasar is not the protagonist of the second novel either. Still, the third novel of the quartet seems slightly out of harmony to me, for some reason I can't quite put my finger on. Clea is a brilliant conclusion to this masterful series of novels. I can't believe it took me such a long time to finally decide to read the Alexandria Quartet, but as the saying goes, better late than never.